Welcome to the video, everyone. Today, uh, as guests, we have Dr. Uh, Jordan Grant and Gil T. Welcome, guys. How you doing, Steve? Hi, Steven. Hi. We're talking about a topic that is requested quite a lot in our Facebook group. It's about DECA or Nandrolone. A lot of people are asking if they can use it as HRT. So do they have to combine it with TRT, with testosterone? What's the difference with testosterone? Or can they do DECA or Nandrolone only? That's what we are going to talk about in this video. Okay, I think Gil wanted to take the lead. Okay, Gil. Hey, so first I have to compliment you're looking awfully swole today in the yes. uh, neon shirt thanks uh, some veins popping uh so i'm glad i wore a long sleeve uh <laughs> <laughs> i um i want to go over a little bit of chemistry if i may uh just so people have a understanding of what the structure of some of these hormones are and then uh let me just get this uh slide here going just give me one second and then uh, I guess we'll let Jordan discuss how this stuff actually works in the body. So this comes up often, right? It's nandrolone versus testosterone. Which one is better or more appropriate for replacement therapy, androgen replacement therapy? Uh, it's important to understand what each one is, what their molecular structure is, and what their metabolites are, because these are all things that are going to affect you. Uh, for starters, it's important to note that testosterone is what's known as a bioidentical hormone. This is on a molecular level. It is a molecule that our body produces naturally, and it therefore recognizes uh, even if it does come in from a synthesized form exogenously. Nandrolone is what is called a derivative of testosterone. It is essentially derived from the testosterone molecule, as are many other steroid molecules. So they're all essentially derivatives of testosterone in one form or another. Uh, we'll get into what nandrolone actually is and how it works. So first and foremost, you got to understand what is a steroid because it often has a negative connotation. Steroids are nothing more than specific types of hormones in our body that have a mechanism of action on various receptors or other uh, glands or tissues in the body. A steroid is nothing more than a molecular structure. There's a specific molecular structure that forms a steroid. It's any class or a large class of organic compounds and you notice organic compounds is highlighted and you'll see why in a moment and it's got a specific characteristic of a molecular structure that contains four carbon atom rings so these four rings three of them are going to be six membered and you'll see that when we get into the the chart and then one is going to be five and they include many hormones alkaloids and vitamins vitamin d for example is a steroid uh, so if you take a look at the molecular structure which we'll look at in a minute these organic compounds, uh, essentially there are four main ones, nucleic acids, which are commonly found in RNA and DNA, which hold your genetic code, and then the three that everyone is familiar with from nutrition, and these are what we call macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids or fats. These are essentially your four types of organic compounds. Now, what is an organic compound? Very simple. It has to contain carbon atoms. They have to be linked to each other and to other atoms. And they have to be linked via covalent bonds, not to get too much into chemistry. We have ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, covalent bonds, uh, polar bonds, et cetera. But they must have covalent bond links. And they're found in cells of living organisms, not in innate objects. Okay? So that is what an organic compound is. The ones with the four rings that are aligned in the way that I explained earlier are essentially steroids. That is a base steroid. And then the modifications around those rings is what determines the mechanism of action or the type of steroid. So getting right into testosterone, you'll notice here, let me just grab a little pointer if I may. And uh, here we go. Okay. So you'll notice here are the four rings. You got ring A, ring B, ring C, and ring D. You'll notice that rings A, B, and C are the six-sided rings and ring D is the five-sided ring. That essentially right there without anything else around it is a steroid molecule. So all steroids share this setup in common, and this would generally be a three-dimensional uh, you know, type of a structure, but it is two-dimensional for the purpose of the slide. So you'll notice the carbon rings, they're numbered. They start going around this way, then they come around this way, 
and then they go out to 10. Now 10 is important because this is where the 19th position pops out. We'll go over it in a minute. It goes back around and then you've got position number 13, which pops out to the 18th. So you have a hydroxyl group, which is oxygen and hydrogen over here. You have a ketone group over here. This is where the two oxygen atoms are found in testosterone. Testosterone has 19 carbons, 28 hydrogens and two oxygens. And position 18 and 19 are what's known as methyl groups. So the methyl group in position 19 is important because this right here is what differentiates testosterone from nandrolones. Nandrolones are a class of steroids that encompass various other underground steroids, but the one that's medically prescribed is nandrolone decanoate or, or, or decadurablin, as, as Stephen referred to earlier. And DECA is a group of, of steroids known as a 19 nor testosterone, nor meaning absent or lacking, um, non existent. And that is where this methylated group here loses its carbon atom and two out of the three hydrogens. Okay, so here's the molecular structure of testosterone C19H28O2. This is testosterone. All testosterone contains this molecular structure. Notice this is a non-esterized testosterone molecule. It's important to note because once you esterize a molecule, whether it's cypionate, propionate, uh, enanthate, uh, undesilinate, whatever it is, the ester is essentially a molecular structure that is added in so that when your body has to work to cleave it off, that is what determines the half-life. So the molecular structure changes with an ester attached. So this is the raw testosterone molecule. Nandrolone molecule, notice that we have kept all of our groups here with the exception of the 19th bond. We had a carbon and three hydrogens here. We have lost a carbon, we've lost two hydrogens, we're down to one hydrogen left. So this makes the molecular structure of nandrolone C18, right? One carbon down, H26, two hydrogens down, and we still kept our uh, uh, hydroxy uh, group over here and our ketone group for the oxygen. So what have we changed? Two hydrogens, one carbon. It is a 19 nor testosterone, missing the 19th carbon position, okay? There you go. Now, why is this important? Because testosterone aromatizes via the aromatase enzyme into what's known as 17 beta estradiol, which has a molecular structure of C18, H24, and O2. So you'll notice estradiol, essentially, when it is, once it is aromatized or catabolized by the aromatase enzyme, testosterone then becomes one molecule short on the carbon, okay, similar to nandrolone, but it loses four hydrogens, whereas nandrolone only loses two. So this difference between nandrolone and beta estradiol, 17 beta estradiol is essentially just two hydrogen molecules. Now, it's also catalyzed by the 5-alpha reductase enzyme into 5-beta dihydrotestosterone, as we know, DHT. And this happens at the C4, C5 position. And I'll show you, and, and this happens via hydrogenation. And I'll show you real quick why it happens in that position. So C4, C5 is right here. You see you have a double hydrogen there. Okay, so hydrogenation means you're adding a hydrogen molecule. Put that back on full screen. All right. And then you'll notice we have not touched the carbon atom in position 19. We've left that alone for DHT, but we have added two hydrogen atoms to the molecule. All right, so DHT is actually a larger molecule than testosterone. It's got 30 hydrogens as opposed to 28 of testosterone. And again, that happened in position four and five of the carbon uh, atom. So nandrolone, now what does nandrolone metabolize into? Okay, because you're beginning with a different structure. You're down two hydrogens, you're down one carbon, and then when the enzymes, 5-alpha reductase and aromatase hit nandrolone, they are not going to have the same effect as they do when they hit testosterone. So what I want to do is I want to essentially let Jordan explain how this differs in the body and why nandrolone in and of itself in the absence of testosterone is not, or maybe it is, Jordan's going to let us know, have sufficient metabolites to give us all of the health benefits of hormone therapy. Right. And that's, I think, the biggest key here is that we're not saying nandrolone is not useful. Um, and Gil's going to talk about that here in a little bit. It's more just saying that 
a lot of people believe that you can take enough nandrolone and if you just take enough, it will give you the proper amounts of estradiol or um, dihydronandrolone. And um, that's what we're going to talk about. So basically nandrolone, we'll start with um, five alpha reductase because it, it actually does uh, bind to that very well. I think it has a very high affinity to 5AR and is converted into dihydronandrolone instead of dihydrotestosterone. The problem with dihydronandrolone, and not that there's a lot of studies on this, but as far as it is, it so has a very weak uh, affinity to the androgen receptor, much weaker than dihydrotestosterone. And so a lot of guys like this because it's, you know, less androgenic. So guys who worry about hair loss, um, they would rather take nandrolone, even though hair loss eventually is going to happen. Um, it's just probably going to slow the process. The problem is you're missing out on the benefits of dihydrotestosterone, which is what we need. So you're kind of, it's a balancing act there with your health, you know. Um, as far as estrogen goes, so I used to be under the impression just reading bodybuilding message boards and all that stuff that nanodone converted, you know, to estradiol at about 20% the rate of testosterone. That's what you read everywhere. Um, upon further review, it, there are actually many scientific papers that consider nandrolone a non-aromatizable compound. Um, the reason for that, which uh, Gil can talk about too, is, is the process of aromatization, which I don't have out in front of me, but starts with attacking C, the 19th carbon position on, uh, on these compounds, and nandrolone doesn't have that. And so um, nandrolone is believed to be actually a waste product, almost like a, a split off during the aromatization process already. Like that's where it comes from naturally when they find it in people. Um, and so the normal process of aromatization of testosterone and estradiol, you can get this offshoot of nandrolone, but it cannot be further aromatized by that enzyme. And um, that's what studies have shown in humans. Um, and I'll try to do this screen share thing if I can. Hang on a sec. Uh, here we go. So y'all can see that. Um, I don't think I have that study up in front of me, but there's a few of these. And the first thing I looked at a long time ago when I started looking into this was just 19 or testosterone derivatives. And those would be more things like birth control type uh, pills and things like that. Those can be converted in the liver to uh, certain types of estrogens, uh, not into 17 beta estradiol, but um, they are converted in the liver in a process similar to aromatization, but it's not actual peripheral aromatization to other kinds of uh, estrogens. And basically this, in this study, they formed uh, ethanol estradiol, um, which is basically a birth control. And that's from tibolone, uh, which is an oral 19 nor testosterone. Um, there was another study here they did, and this is just the, not the full study, I've got it saved somewhere, and they used a lot of different nortestosterone compounds, but one of these was nandrolone, pure nandrolone. And at the end, you can see that um, 19 nortestosterone was limited aromatization and was very slow. And there was a graph on this, I don't have it in here. Here it is, it won't let me click on it. But you could see the line at the bottom and it was just flat and it was almost no relevant estradiol at all. Um, and so, and that's that was where they were just using nor testosterone. I wish it would let me click on that. Um, and then there was, uh, I'm trying to think one more paper. Um, I think it was out of a textbook, actually. I don't have the textbook. Uh, I'll get out of this. It was out of a textbook on pediatric and adult endocrinology. And um, in the chapter, uh, they listed references, but they basically state that parenteral, meaning injected nandrolone, is not aromatizable. It's not an aromatizing compound. Um, there's a good, and it's just an article, and I'll show you all real quick, because people are going to say, oh, that's bro science or whatever. It was actually on a bodybuilding forum. but written by a doctor and it has references here and it's actually very good because it he basically found the same things I had found looking all this up there's not that much data out there on it and he's got references here at the bottom but he was trying to actually dispel the myth that nandrolone aromatizes to a lot of the bros and bodybuilders so if y'all can ever want to look this up you can just google does, does nandrolone aromatize into an estrogen uh, and I think it's it's very well written out, actually. Uh, and he's got the references down here at the bottom that you can see. And a lot of them are papers that I already had saved. Um, overall, basically, we're saying that nandrolone does not provide enough, if any, estradiol. If it did aromatize, it would not convert into true bioidentical 
17 beta estradiol. That's another key factor here. I think it's something like boldenone uh, does not convert into true 17 beta estradiol. It's going to be a little modified. Oral steroids that people talk about taking to get their estrogen from, like Dianabol, um, that's not going to convert into a pure bioidentical estradiol. It's going to have a methyl group. It's going to be a little different and likely cause a lot more issues, maybe a lot stronger. And that's why probably guys get a lot more gyno and things like that when they take Dianabol. Um, same thing with mint, uh, which is a very popular anabolic steroid. A lot of people talked about using it as a hormone replacement. It, it does, it's a nandrolone, um, but it does aromatize actually, because its structure is different than just pure nandrolone. So those things are important for guys to consider. Um, I need to find the paper. I don't have it, but they were comparing testosterone to nandrolone and a couple, of, I don't know if it was in, no, guys in the army, um, and they showed their blood levels side by side on testosterone and then their E2 levels, which they weren't sensitive E2 levels, but it was still there. And then on the nandrolone side, and there was a huge difference in the E2 levels. You could just tell same dose of each compound. So that there's lots of evidence out there that nandrolone does not aromatize. And so that's, that's kind of the point we're making is that you're not going to get sufficient levels of estradiol if you do nandrolone only. And when we talk about get enough to support your health, your bone health, to prevent neurotoxicity, um, all of these things, libido, everything like that. And a lot of guys say, well, I feel better when I'm just on nandrolone. Well, how you feel mentally does not always mean that you're being safe um, from a health standpoint. Nandrolone does act as a progestin, and those can make people feel better, uh, enhance mood. So it makes sense that you can feel better on nandrolone, but that doesn't tell the whole story. So that's what I got. Well, yeah, ironically, like I said earlier, I was just talking to Joe Francis, who's a phenomenal uh, uh, physician out in, in Ohio, uh, who treats a lot of women. And, and he actually was, was doing some men recently. And he told me that he has noticed a lot of uh, men who supplement with pregnenolone, which is a precursor for progesterone, uh, essentially tend to feel better emotionally. And some of them have come off SSRIs. Mm -hmm. So yes, the initial spike in, in progesterone may help that sense of well-being, but over the long term, as we know, once metabolites catch up and once the big picture comes in months down the road, and again, we're talking about HRT, this is a lifelong replacement therapy, the effects are not going to be long-lived, and even the guys who promote these nandrolone-only cycles to the performance crowd always say, get on short-term, come off, get back on, come off. So they're kind of doing these little spurts. And the reason is to prevent this metabolite action. So to go ahead and say, well, we're going to use this as a standalone for HRT, which is designed for optimization of health and promoting a sense of well-being lifelong. Um, it's just a flawed concept. Uh, if you look, we were just talking uh, right before we started uh, taping about uh, the, the conjugated uh, equine estrogens, uh, which were branded as Primarin and, and sold to women throughout the 90s into the early part of 2000s, uh, which later they found were women coming down with, with, you know, endometrium issues and cancers and breast cancer. And that's what labeled estrogen as the devil, essentially. But again, these were synthetic estrogens derived from horses. They were extracted from horse urine. So when you look at an animal study of an androlone or any compound for that matter, and how the mechanism of action in an animal or aromatization in an animal, animal occurs, and then you try to compare that to a human study, again, the bioidentical factors are just not there. Right. We know that testosterone is bioidentical. Our body produces the molecule of C19, H2802. It recognizes, it knows what to do with it, and all the enzymes responsible for utilizing that further are going to understand how to handle that molecule. Once you have a derivative, which all of these other anabolics are, they're essentially derivatives of a base testosterone molecule, you're going into battle with not all of your tools present. All right, if, if I have a pizzeria with a secret recipe and I have my flour and I make this pizza and you love it, and the next day you come in and I, I use semolina flour or rice flour or coconut flour, you're gonna notice the difference. It's still pizza, but it's not the same. So to assume that a nandrolone, which is the raw ingredient for your metabolites, DHN or, or these uh, uh, ethanol estradiols or whatever other forms may be metabolized, are going to give you the same mechanism of action as our bioidentical hormone is just flawed, plain and simple. So I want to point that out. And then if you want to touch on the areas where it can benefit or it can be used, uh, we could certainly get into that because I know a lot of guys always question, what can I yeah. do with an nandrolone on top of my TRT? Yeah, I think that'd be good for you to hit on. I was going to just say, what uh, to echo what you just said, you can't look at animal studies and uh, extrapolate those always to humans because there are 
uh, I think equine uh, testicular, I can't remember what it is, aromatase, it does aromatize nagarola. But in human, in human aromatase, it does not. So a lot of guys will post these animal studies and that's great, but you need to actually show human studies because we, we're different. Um, as much as people like to think that we're, we're so much the same, uh, there's a big difference. Same thing with bacterial enzymes. We'll do these in vitro studies and cell cultures. And that, that has nothing to do with physiology. It really, it's interesting and it may prompt questions to be looked at in humans one day. Once you remove cells from their natural environment and start manipulating them in a dish, you've completely ruined physiology. That, that's not physiologic anymore. Mm -hmm. So similar to in vivo and vitro. I mean, it just, right. it's not so the same. Right. Exactly. You know, there's the cellular respiration process in vitro is completely different than once you go ahead and start, you know, uh, respiration in, in, you know, in the outside world, it's everything changes. Yeah. You know, we know our lungs actually act as endocrine glands as well. They actually excrete their own hormones that act on, uh, you know, renal function and other aspects, uh, blood pH and everything else. So, so yeah, once the lungs come into the picture, I mean, the entire balance of hormones changes. Yeah. And then one more thing I want to touch on is, you know, people have said, well, you, the dihydronandrolone, as long as you have a compound activating the receptor, that's all that matters. That doesn't make sense because these people are promoting nandrolone over tests. Well, if what they say is true, then they wouldn't be promoting nandrolone over, you know what I mean? Right. Because they're all hitting the same receptors. No, that's a valid point. Testosterone. And you know what, if that, if that, if we want to look at it, if we want to simplify it to that extent, insulin resistance would not exist. Right. You've got a receptor, you got insulin, you hit it, go to work. I mean, right. there's different variations in the level of response uh, to various compounds at various right. aspects. So, And when you look at the, some papers on an antigen receptors and how the binding domains and ligand binding, non-ligand binding, there's cofactors, co-repressors, all these crazy things. It's not just a lock and key like it once once thought. And I'm sure in five years, it'll be completely different from what we know now because they don't, they can't see these things. I think people think that these pictures and everything are, are real and they're not. They're, they're doing a lot of crazy experiments just to find this stuff out. Um, but from what we know right now, it's not just a lock and key. It's uh, compound has specific effects on the receptor itself, which may determine a genetic response that'll be different based on the compound. Yeah, when you're doing when you're doing studies on uh, on hormones specifically, it is so difficult to control dependent variables because you make one change, but you don't know if the other dependent variables that are just biological occurrences happen. Yeah, we don't even know what all there are. I mean, there's there's millions of them we don't even know exist that are. And that's the problem. Genetics, for one, you can have a control group with completely different genetics and not even know about it. And then one guy responds one way and another responds another way. And the only variable you have is what you've changed, but you don't see the millions of other variables. It is a very difficult topic to study. Yeah. And uh, because of that, we have to look at the macro picture. And, and, and while we try to analyze the micro, we have to look at the big picture. And in the big picture, we know just by logic that, you know, you give one ingredient, the outcome is going to be different. You give testosterone, you get estradiol. You give nandrolone, right. you don't get 17 beta estradiol. You just physically cannot. Molecularly, it just cannot happen. I agree. And it's the bigger picture that matters with what we're doing because this we're just trying to be practical here. The, the tiny little micro uh, picture, it's interesting, but we're not going to know it. Honestly, we probably never will. There's always going to be things we don't know. But and this can lead also back into the other aspect of where does nandrolone have a place in HRT? And Look, we know that nandrolone tends to increase aldosterone significantly more than testosterone. I'm not quite sure if it's understood why. Maybe you can shed light on it if you have an idea. I think the theory is it actually just stimulates the aldosterone receptor more, uh, mineral corticoid action, so more mm -hmm. uh, uptake in the kidney of uh, fluid. Uh, yeah, this causes sodium retention, right. uh, which is the key factor likely on why the synovial joints tend to feel better when using nandrolone because you're increasing the, the mineral and, and fluid retention within the, the synovial capsule, which acts as a lubricant. So whether you have osteoarthritis, which is essentially wear and tear from the bones, or whether you have rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune condition uh, where the body attacks the joint and causes inflammation, either way, uh, lubrication is going to make you feel better. Does this just mask the problem or does it actually heal? Well, again, this depends on the cause of the issue. I would think that in osteoarthritis, more lubrication would help. And I would think in the sense of uh, inflammation, and I think they test for it by uh, maybe C-reactive protein, and then they also do specific localized testing on synovial fluid and sodium 
and aldosterone within the joint. I think they extract from the joint to test it. But uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, I don't know if it helps. It may, I mean, you're adding fluid to an inflamed area. Um, I don't know long-term if that's really gonna be a, a great idea. What, what's your yeah. take? Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, we just need more studies. Like there's a few small studies. They're all more just like survey based on how people felt on this and they improved, you know, subjectively their joint pain was improved. There was a study they did on, was it rats or something where they disarticulated their shoulder? They did something to the, or cut the supraspinatus tendon and then injected nandrolone directly and they looked at the effect. It's like, where's your control group? I mean, you had a, you had a control group, but how about control it also with testosterone? Like, you know, I mean, so that was interesting to me that they're just looking at nandrolone, but I mean, anyway, so. Um, Our study yeah, showing a, that nandrolone has increased cardiovascular risks. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, Arterial sclerosis. And most of those are animal studies, obviously, because I mean, it's just for ethical purposes and not that many people use an nandrolone legally. So it's gonna be hard to study that. But yeah. And I think a lot of that is to the lack of estradiol. I'll, I'll be honest. That's my, there may be a direct toxic effect. Um, yeah. It's the same with neurotoxicity, but I think uh, it's postulated a lot of that is due to the lack of estradiol. So it makes sense because um, that's cardioprotective and it's neuroprotective, estradiol is. So uh, obviously there's probably a dose response relationship as with all things too. How, how toxic is it in, in humans versus rats or whatever? I mean, we don't know. There's, there was an in vitro study that came out a few years ago that freaked everybody out, all the bodybuilders. Uh, discussing nandrolone and cardiotoxicity, but I, I don't think it was in vivo. Um, it was just on cell lines. Um, so I don't know how much you can take from that. So. Other health issues, uh, Gil, that nandrolone can be used for? Yeah, like we just discussed, I think people that suffer from joint pain uh, could probably benefit from some nandrolone supplementation. I do recommend uh, two things. First, pharmaceutical grade. Uh, I, I wish that, that nandrolone phenylpropionate was still produced as a medication. Uh, I like the fast acting effects that it offers. I like the, f the fact that if someone doesn't take well to the medication and happens mm -hmm. to experience any unintended side effects, it's quick to leave your system. Whereas the Deconoate the ester, I believe is about a 14 day half-life. And once you start to compound that into a steady state, you're mm -hmm. probably looking at an excretion uh, of about, give or take, uh, about two months until it's it's more than that, out. actually. So um, what's interesting about nandrolone itself, even without an ester, is still broken down much slower. So it actually, that's why they can detect it two years later, you know, when you come off. Uh, even so, even yeah, I think the detection, the detection is significant and it may have to do with metabolites. Yeah. Um, and I know detection in a lot of the compounds is significantly longer than the active life. But I think that five half-lives after discontinuing is essentially the excretion rate of yeah. where it's no longer effective in the body per se. So if yeah. you had side effects specifically to the hormone, I yeah. think that if you multiply the 14-day half-life by five, you're looking at roughly you know, two and a half months. I think at that point, you're pretty much in a safe field. Yeah. But yeah, detection, absolutely. If you're running this in a, in a, you know, without medical supervision and you're, you're engaged in sports or a, a job that would test you for anabolics, you're, you're looking at a couple of years of uh, potentially being on the hook there. Yeah. And the other good point about nano and phenylpropionate would be a lot of these guys, if, let's say they're younger and they want to take it for joint pain with their TRT, but they're still worried about fertility. Nandrolone is very suppressive compared to testosterone. Mm -hmm. So you might be better with the phenylpropionate if you wanted to come off quicker than dealing with the longer part of uh, DECA. So. I agree. The problem we have is that it is not available as a medication. It is only right. uh, uh, an, an illegal uh, yeah. type of a product these days. And it was, it was the original, I believe the original DECA Durablin was a, a, or it was just called Durablin, not DECA, it was just called Durablin. Durablin. Yes. It was yes. neandrolone phenylpropionate ester. Right. And then when they came out with the uh, decadarablin, that was the longer yeah. ester. Yeah. But it is available via compounding pharmacies. It's 200 milligrams per ml. It's available mm -hmm. by prescription. Um, and, and it is used alongside testosterone, not in place of, alongside testosterone in some patients. It does promote healing. Uh, I think it has a bigger affinity for uh, erythropoiesis. So therefore, guys who are potentially anemic are probably going to benefit from a low dose nandrolone, but guys who are prone to elevation of hemoglobin are probably not going to have a good time with nandrolone because it's going to push them well over the edge. Yeah. I think another good one is always, which we forget about is people with muscle wasting diseases. Um, 
I mean, in any of these compounds, that's where they shine. That's where things other than testosterone really shine because they are more anabolic than testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, and nandrone would probably be a safe, a very safe anabolic to take compared to an oral as far as long term to prevent muscle wasting. I agree. Uh, low that. dose oxandrolone is probably not a big deal, but a lot of these people are already on medicines that are stressing their liver. Um, and something that doesn't stress the liver like nandrolone would, it's just so much more anabolic than testosterone. A lot of people with muscle wasting disease um, probably are fighting off some, some infections, diseases that are inflammatory. They may be using NSAIDs, Tylenol, painkillers, and the livers probably cannot handle a C17 alpha alkylated. Um, which, by the way, interesting point, when we were looking at the slide earlier, the 19th position and then the 17th position, which was the one where the hydroxy group is. Uh, that is where the 17 alkylation occurs for the orals, just in case anyone was wondering how those are derived. There was the hydroxy group that is alkylated in order to bypass the first pass of the liver uh, so that the hormone survives, uh, yep. which is why testosterone is not bioavailable orally unless right. you go with the... <laughs> the, uh, the uh, Ethyl testosterone. Yeah, exactly. And that is uh, extremely toxic and needs to be dosed quite often. So. I didn't realize until recently I had a friend, female, show me that she was on that. I didn't realize they were given low dose methyl testosterone to women. Yeah. I, no idea. I didn't no, know any, it. anything to avoid the injection. It's just, yeah. a, it's, it's just a stigma. You know, I try to explain to people that when you're dealing with nutrition and medicine, stop thinking like a social person. Stop thinking like a human being who is tainted by media and social uh, judgment. Okay. Injections are nothing more than getting medication into your system. Oral administration is nothing more than doing the same, right? Topicals are nothing more than doing the same. The goal here is get these molecules that are designed to hate, help or aid in a specific area into your systemic circulation. What is the most effective and efficient way to do this while minimizing damage to your organs and getting the most out of your treatment. And if injection is the answer, so be it. Right. Get away from the whole social stigma. There's nothing wrong with it. Nobody bats an eye when a diabetic injects insulin. Right. Okay, believe me, if they could take a pill to get their insulin, they would. Yep. But it doesn't work that way. Neither do most hormones. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. good point. Is there a certain nandrolone to testosterone ratio that is recommended? What do you think? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, so this is, a, this is a little tricky because if you're looking from a medical standpoint, most testosterone therapy guys are going to be, depending on, again, without getting into frequency, let's look at total milligrams per week. Mm -hmm. I would say most guys find symptom resolution anywhere between 80 to 160 per week. Some guys need to go to 200, 220, et cetera. I mean, the outliers are going to be above that. But if you look at the mass majority of men, 80 to 160 milligrams per week of testosterone, uh, cypionate is going to find symptom resolution. By the same token, if you were going to look at nandrolone from a medical use perspective, and this is again, uh, post-op healing, uh, osteoporosis, which by the way, bone mineral density, I think it has a great affinity, better than testosterone to increase that. And again, this probably has to do with the, uh, the mineral partitioning. Uh, but if you look at the benefits medically, not talking about anabolic use, but medical uses of nandrolone, I think that 50 to 100 milligrams a week are going to give you symptom resolution in most cases. So if you want to look at it from a medical to medical standpoint, milligram per milligram, it's probably a two to one in favor of testosterone. Right. Where if you look at the bodybuilding world, because of the anabolic properties of nandrolone, it's usually going to be a two to one or three to one in the other direction where the nandrolone is going to be high, your testosterone is going to be a base, uh, presumably for the aromatization factors and the DHT factors, while yep. maintaining the androgen receptor affinity towards the stronger anabolic. Which, I mean, I know we're not an anabolic channel, but that's something guys doing that need to think about um, because nandrolone itself can bind to aromatase and act as an aromatase inhibitor. That was in one of these papers and I've seen it in blood work. I've seen guys on nandrolone with enough tests that you'd think they would have enough estradiol based on serum levels. Obviously we don't know what the tissue levels are, but it's a surrogate marker. Um, and their estradiol was very low compared to what it would be on test alone. So I know that's where you start getting into guys, well, side effects and all that. And I understand that, but so you got to balance your health with what you're doing. And if you're on these high doses of nandrolone for a long time, your health is likely suffering quite a bit just from not having estradiol and DHT. If people use DECA, nandrolone, long-term for these health issues of our uh, health uh, benefits, is that forever? Does it have to be cycled? Is it safe long-term? 
what are your opinions? I think that as with anything, having a provider who understands the mechanism of action, not just read something online and said, here, try it. Um, don't be someone's guinea pig. Make sure they understand at the very, and look, we don't know it all. We, we learn on a daily basis. The day you stop learning is the day you stop regressing. Okay, so you can never let your ego flow before you. However, if you have someone who's fairly competent and experienced with the use of specific hormones, it is essential to get your labs done and to have the subjective assessments done regarding how you're feeling at the same time and make sure that they both check out. You better feel good and you better look it on paper. And as long as that's happening and it's dose dependent and it's individual dependent, uh, everyone responds differently as we know. But as long as both are there, I don't think it's something you necessarily need to cycle off. If you've got a guy on 140 milligrams of testosterone and 50 milligrams of nandrolone and he's doing well and everything looks great on his labs and he feels great. I mean, what is going to trigger you saying, I need you to come off for three or six months and get back on? Why, just because you think he needs to cycle it? I mean, yeah. yet there has to be a reason. We can't just do things for the sake of doing that. It's, it's you know, it's insane to me to think that the guys are, are, are finally dialing in and then their doctor takes them off just because he's hurt somewhere that this, you can't stay on it. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's horrible. I agree. I totally agree. I think that, the, and, and this is all just speculation, I think 50 milligrams a week of mandrolone or even 100 is probably not detrimental long term, especially if you're getting enough testosterone to provide E2 and DHT. I think they, I mean, even done studies on HIV patients with mandrolone only, and obviously that's a different patient population. They're more concerned about quality of life in those guys and not quantity of life. Um, but they did look at certain health markers in those guys, and, and I can't remember how long the studies were done, but nothing horrible happened to them on 200 milligrams a week of Nandrolone. So, um, but again, th those are skewed, you know, based on what they're looking for. So, but 50 to 100 milligrams a week of Nandrolone, I mean, it'd be great to have studies on that. I hope somebody would do it one day, but it's, it's likely pretty safe. Okay. I think that's all for me. Um, anything you wanted to add, Gil, Jordan, before we close this up? I think, uh, unbeknownst to us, we went off on a little tangent that probably covered a lot of people's questions. Uh, these questions come up in the group all the time. Uh, we had a specific purpose to cover. We did that initially, and then I think we kind of went off and covered a little bit extra. And uh, if there's more to cover, there's always next weekend. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Jordan, Gil. Talk to you next time. Right, Pleasure. Thanks, Thank you.